fact, a lot of the R source code is written in C and Fortran. One of the great benefits of R is that it runs on a wide variety of platforms, so Linux, Mac, and Windows, and you all get the sort of same installation, you get access to the same features, to the same functions, and to the same packages. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention RStudio. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about RStudio today, but I, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, it's a user interface to, to R, and I think a lot of people that would learn R today would actually start on RStudio rather than just base R. It's kind of prettier. So R has become very popular over the years. Um, so I was searching the web for like popularity measures and I uh, came across this blog on the R for Stats blog. And the figure on the, your, your left shows the popularity rank on GitHub on the x-axis and popularity rank on Stack Overflow on the y-axis. And I've just circled R, so you can see it, amongst other programming languages, it really has become quite popular. Um, another way of measuring popularity is with this IEEE Spectrum Language Popularity Rankings. And R is ranked sixth in 2015, and this is up from ninth position in 2014. So I think R is, is becoming much more popular as the years go on. In terms of comparing to other analytical software, other statistical software, it is the most popular tool. And this is according to the survey run last year. Um, at the top of this figure, you can see that R is winning. The green bar is whether, what tool you use as your primary tool, and the green is whether you use this as a secondary tool. Um, so the next most popular one is SPSS, and then SAS, and then there's Excel, which is kind of horrific, but at least it's not got a lot of green bar, it's mostly blue bar. And the main reason I think that R is so popular is that it's free. Competing statistical software tools are incredibly expensive. I tried to Google search like the costs of an annual license, um, and a lot of these software, statistical softwares won't even tell you on the internet. You have to like call their, their representative to get a quote. But just to give you an idea, a one-year license for SAS, which is probably one of the best statistical softwares, is $11,000. Uh, for SPSS, it's about $3,500. And for Stata, which is another software that I've used, it's about $800 for an annual license. So R is a really powerful tool. It's one of the few stats softwares that are command line driven, and it really does empower people to do reproducible research. And I think open source also means that you can learn from others. Um, you have the ability to produce publication quality graphics. And I'm not going to talk too much about graphics today, but I am going to show you a couple of examples. It also gives you access to cutting edge techniques. So you might have to wait two or three years after a paper comes out on a new method for that method to be implemented into something like SAS. But often these days, when you write a new method, you'll have an R package that goes with it and that goes with your publication. You also have access to lots and lots of different packages. So you've got access to lots and lots of different analysis tools and visualization tools as well. So just quickly, I'll show you two examples of graphics. And they're a little bit different. So this is one that I did for just using base R, so ordinary R, no fancy packages, nothing. That's what I call base R. And this was for a paper that we published in Genome Biology. And the thing that makes graphics so powerful in R is that you can change every little thing about this figure. You can change the size of the points, the color of the points, um, a left justified title, right justified title, um, how far the axis labels are away from the graph. You can suppress axis labels. Um, and these are just, this is just the number of lines of code that it took to produce this, this panel figure. It's really, one of the really cool things is that I made this panel in R. So I told it that I wanted, so if you can imagine there's like six places on this panel, and I told it that I wanted one figure in the first spot, another figure in the second spot, the third figure needs to accompany the third and fourth positions, and the last figure needs to be in the fifth and sixth positions. This is quite a different figure. So this figure was made by a colleague of mine, Jovana Maximovich, and she used this library called GVIS to produce this really quite complicated um, figure that's got three different data types, 
Um, it's got annotation of the genes that are changing. And it took her 236 lines of R code to produce this figure. If anyone ever asks me to do this, I'll say I don't know how to do it. So one of the great things about R is that you've got this extensive R community. Um, so there's R user groups all around the world. And in Melbourne, we've got the Melbourne Users of R Network. It's a meetup group that meet once a month. Um, you've also got, there's also a yearly conference. I think it's usually in the US or Europe. And there's places to put your packages. So CRAN is sort of the, the formal repository that's associated with R. Um, Bioconductor is sort of where we put all of our bioinformatics packages. And there's also RForge and, of course, GitHub. And there's plenty of places to get help when you're stuck. Um, you can turn to the R mailing list. You can look at Stack Overflow, R bloggers. You can also turn to Twitter. So I think R is pretty great, um, except not so much for the kind of data that I see in my day-to-day -day job, which is what I call high-dimensional data, which maybe means something different to other people. But um, there's been quite a lot of actual biological motivation, so I'm just going to, in the previous talks, I'm just going to skim through this quite quickly. Let's say we've got a tumor. We want to know what genes are changing in this tumor. Some biologist person goes and does their biology stuff to extract the RNA. And then that gets sent off to the sequencer, and they sequence lots of little reads. And then there's lots and lots of steps. And then finally, we got some data out, which is this table of count data, where we've got 20, 30,000 genes uh, as rows and as many samples as you've got as you want. So sometimes you've only got a few samples. Sometimes you can have hundreds or thousands of samples. So we've got a really big table of counts. And sort of, really, we want to answer a question, um, a biological question with the analysis. For example, can what's happening in this tumor inform us about which drugs to give the patient? So I'm just going to go through a really simple example. So um, we've got this one gene, the DNER. Let's call it DINER. It's easy to say. It's probably completely wrong. But um, we want, I want to know whether the expression level of this gene changes between cancer samples and normal samples. So I've got a vector of length 10 here. Um, there's five normal samples and five cancer samples. And this is um, a nice, quick and easy way to visualize this data using a strip chart in R um, with log expression on the y-axis and the grouping variable on the x-axis. And the horizontal bars are just the means of the two groups. And so I want to know whether this difference between the group means is statistically significant. So as a statistician, I know that the most common way to do this is with a t-test. So in R, the first command I typed was a question mark t.test. And the dot is just an ordinary character. It doesn't mean anything special. Because I don't remember the syntax. I never remember syntax. But I had to know that the t-test function was called t.test. And this is the kind of help that comes up. So the t-test is in the stats package. And there's information at the very top. It gives you a description of the function. So it says, OK, this performs one and two sample t-tests on vectors of data. Vectors, very important in R. Um, and then there's some syntax under the usage. There's the arguments that the function takes. There's output. There's examples. There's a bigger description of what the function does lower down. So I can figure out quite easily how to implement this function. So everything in R is vectorized. And I'm not actually really going to go into this, because this is actually another talk all on its own when I started looking at this online. But even scalars are vectors of length 1 in R. And so I can represent my the DINA gene expression vector as a vector, DINA. Um, and also, my, I've got a grouping. Can I use the? So I've also got a grouping variable, which tells me um, that this particular expression measurement corresponds to a normal sample, whereas the last five correspond to my cancer sample. And there's two ways that you can implement this t-test. So this top way is um, called the formula notation. So this is my outcome, which is the gene expression measure. And this is the grouping variable that I want to test. So I want to know what's different between cancer and normal for this particular gene. And this is the kind of output that you get. You get the t statistic, some degrees of freedom, p value. Oh, look, very highly significant, less than 0.05, yay, and some other stuff. 
you can also um, run this function like this, where you can just give it, so the square brackets here subset the diner um, vector, it just extracts the cancer expression measurements, and this one just looks at the normal expression measurements. So I can just give it two vectors, one for normal, one for cancer, and you get exactly the same output. But the thing is, I want to test 20,000 genes simultaneously. So I actually have a matrix. I don't just have one vector for one gene. I have a matrix where I've got 20,000 genes, but I want to test the exact same thing on every single row of my matrix. But the problem with base R is that many functions are not designed for matrices. So if I were to naively give the t-test function a log counts matrix, just here I'm just giving it the first um, 10 genes, and exactly the same syntax formula, syntax testing for the differences in groups, and this is the output that you get. You get one t-statistic and one p-value, whereas what I want to see is 10 t-statistics and 10 p-values. So it's just converted the matrix into a vector and, and done something, which is not the thing that I wanted it to do. So you need to do some form of looping, and there's lots of ways to do this. There's lots of ways to do looping in R. Some are better than others. But just naively, let's decide to do a for loop. So in R, the best thing to do is you need to decide what you want to get, what things you want to store when you run your for loop. So you set up those vectors first. Um, so I want to, I've decided to store the t statistic and the p value. So I'm just going to do 10 genes. So I'm setting up an empty vector of length 10 for t statistic and for p value. And then I can just do run a little for loop, which I think the syntax is fairly similar to other languages, I hope, um, where I'm running the t-test on every single row of my log counts matrix. And I'm extracting the t-statistic and the p-value and storing them. And then at the end, I can output, um, this is just a column bind, C bind function that outputs t-statistic and p-value next to each other. You can make it a lot prettier. The thing is, though, is that statistical calculations are based on matrix algebra, and matrix calculations in R are a lot faster than running for loops. So matrix operations in R already exist, and they are already in there, in the source code. So there's two different syntaxes, I guess. So there's a star and a percent star percent, and they do different things. I'm just going to illustrate with a really simple example, a really small little matrix, five by five with just one, two, three, four, five in each of the rows. And I'm just going to multiply it by itself. So if I said mat times mat, what that means is that it multiplies each element together. So one times one is one, two times two is four, and that's what that means to R. If I use percent star percent, that is telling it to do proper matrix multiplication, where you take each row and multiply it by the column, and uh, add the elements together. So 1 times 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 3 times 1, etc., to get 15. So there's already this functionality built into R. So why don't R functions do this automatically? So this problem actually hasn't commonly been encountered in classical statistical applications, and R was it's a statistical software tool. And the R core team, well, hell will freeze over before they make drastic changes to base R. And so, out of necessity, the Bioconductor Project started in 2001 to address the unique issues facing researchers in bioinformatics. So, Bioconductor is an open source, open development software project to provide tools for the analysis and comprehension of high throughput genomic data. And it is based primarily on the R programming language. The first paper for Bioconductor was published in 2004. And there are a number of authors, and they're from all over the world, which really highlights what a collaborative effort it is. And in, from this paper, they, they state that the goals of their project are to foster collaborative development and widespread use of innovative software, reduce barriers to entry into scientific research, and promote the achievement of remote reproducibility of research results. So what's in Bioconductor? There are three sort of streams. One is software, what they call software which has 1,104 packages, and these are mostly statistical methods. The next one is annotation data. There's almost 900 packages, and that's exactly what it is, you know, annotating your gene. Where does this gene come from in the genome? What chromosome it is on? Where's genomic location? 
There's also a much smaller stream called experiment data. Um, and these are just packages that contain data used for illustrative purposes. For example, if you have data set, you're writing a book and you use data sets and you've got some code in there, people can just go get the package and test out your code as they read your book. So these are some of the download stats for Bioconductor packages that I took, looked at a few days ago. Um, these are the top 75 downloaded packages in the last 12 months. I've highlighted the Lima and Edger um, software packages because those are the ones I've been involved in. And just over the last 12 months, there's been almost 80,000 downloads from unique IP addresses for Lima and 37,000 for Edger. Um, I, write, uh, I have a little software package with Yavana Maximovich called Miss Methyl, and it's really nice to be able to look at the download stats and to see who's, how many people are using it. So each month you, get, you can see how many distinct IPs have downloaded your package and how many total downloads there are. So testing, going back to the problem of testing um, 20,000 genes, it's really easy and fast with the right package. So I'm just going to show you one way of doing it. There's lots of different ways of doing it. But um, if you use the Lima library, so this just um, loads the Lima library into your session. It's, you can see that the syntax is a bit different to the t-test syntax. And this is a common thing. I don't want to say problem. But in our, with our packages and Barkenduff package being written by so many different people, and people have different ideas on syntax. So often, you have to look up the syntax because it's all different. But this one has got a model.matrix function, which just sets up how, what you're testing, which is group, which is normal versus cancer. This is what a design matrix looks like. LM fit here is the equivalent of doing 20,000 t-tests simultaneously, but on my matrix of log counts using my design matrix. And then this eBase function takes the fit object from this step, and it performs some extra additional little statistical modifications. And then you can also pass it various arguments. For example, I've set trend equals true here. And then finally, top table, fit, second coefficient, which is to do with the design matrix. I mean, I want to know what's the top 10 differential expressed genes between normal and cancer. And this is the kind of output that you get. So with five lines of code, um, you've got what you want. So for each gene, you've got the log for, there's a lot of jargon in bioinformatics. A log for change is basically the difference between the two group means. Average expression, we've got a T statistic, P value, adjusted P value, et cetera. So we've got all the interesting things that we want to know about every single gene that we're testing. So just to finish off, I want to just tell you a little bit about um, getting a package into Bioconductor, my experience, I guess. So every package must go through a curation process where a person is assigned to your package and looks at every single line of code that you've written. Every package has to meet certain minimum standards to be accepted, which are listed on the Bioconductor website. And every package has to have proper documentation. I think this is key to Bioconductor packages' success. It has to have not only those help pages that I showed you, but a user manual vignette um, that has a detailed case study that, of how to use your package. Every package has to compile and build successfully on multiple platforms without warnings and without errors. And um, I was having the issue where I was only getting an error on the Mac build, and I use Windows. I don't know if I should be embarrassed about that or not. But, um, but I was getting so frustrated debugging my package that I had to go and buy a Mac and learn how to use a Mac. Not a bad experience. Um, so the benefits to having a Bioconductor package, it's really easy to install packages from within R. It's basically two lines of code, and it just installs it all for you. Um, the packages are built daily. And someone will tell you if your package is broken and you haven't noticed from the build reports. I don't check the build reports every day. But if there's a problem, someone will email you. You have access to the Bioconductor developers mailing list where people discuss issues. Um, it's also a very convenient way to distribute your package. And if you do come up with a new method and you publish it, having the accompanying Bioconductor package really gives you kudos, I think. And this is in the words of Jeff Leake, who um, wrote this blog post, how I decide when to trust an R package. And he trusts Bioconductor packages first, CRAN packages next, and GitHub packages last. But I think really because GitHub packages are often still in testing. So people, it's maybe people want other people to try them, but really it's, it's maybe haven't, all the bugs haven't been worked out. So I didn't really know what to call this slide because I don't want to be negative, I just want to be positive. So I called it pros, which can also be cons. 
So anyone can submit a package, even someone like me, not a software engineer, maybe not, maybe shouldn't be coding. But, um, but so the coding style is mostly curated, but bad code is not. So there's still plenty of packages on Bioconductor that are really slow, don't actually do what they say they do. So you can't really get away from that. Dependencies, I could kind of go on about dependencies. Um, so you're, you're discouraged from reinventing the wheel, which I think is good. So if you want your package to do something, but there's a function in another package that does the same thing, you make your package depend on their package so that you can import all of their functions when your package is loaded. But if they change their package and it breaks, then it will break your code and then you have to sort it out. So it can be kind of irritating. It also can take a while to get through the curation process and have your package accepted. So my top tip for that is write a package with a buddy and you can share the, the pain, basically, of going through the process. Um, there's also an extensive Bioconductor community. There's a yearly conference um, with workshops and there's a developer day. Um, all of Bioconductor courses are available freely online and Bioconductor is committed to open source and to remaining open source like for the future. Um, there's an excellent support site where your questions will be answered within 24 to 48 hours. You can also turn to Biostars and seek answers. Um, so just to summarize, I really feel that RM Bioconductor has played a pivotal role in shaping how bioinformaticians analyze their data. And I think that open source really, truly is the key to their success. And there's a strong worldwide community of R and Bioconductor users and developers, so you really feel like you're, you're part of a, a wider community. And you never, ever stop learning about cool stuff in R. And I'll just finish off with some acknowledgements, and uh, thank you for coming and listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Belinda. Thanks for that nice overview on R and Bioconductor and showing how important they are for us in our area. Uh, does anyone have questions for Belinda? I just have one quick question. How long typically does it take to go through the curation process if your package is decent? Um, well, okay, so I, I thought I would cheat, right? So I submitted a package in a very early stage where it only did two things, two things. So I thought, oh, there's not a lot of code. We just need to get it in, and then once it's accepted, then we can just add to it. It doesn't re-go through the curation process. But So I had two things, and I think, it, okay, it wasn't like months, but it was on the order of weeks um, of getting it in. And just things that, it, that weren't really obvious to us, sort of like um, you have to wrap every line at 80 characters, uh, indents have to be four spaces and multiples of four spaces, and I, I can't remember all the things, but these are things that I didn't really know that it had to be like that. Um, and then just going through basically every line and, and fixing it up. Okay, so it sounds like the Abacus Bioconductor's developer training could be quite useful. Yes, <laughs> Maybe. I'm quite excited okay. about that. Yeah. Okay, thanks Belinda.